The application area that we're working in is bioprocess engineering, specifically the production of biopharmaceuticals using mammalian cell culture. And the real challenge that we face is that the biochemistry in this situation is very poorly understood. We do know that if we feed the cells different things in different combinations, that they'll behave differently, and that certain metabolites will be key in maximizing the amount of biomass we get, um, the productivity of those cells in terms of the protein production, and the end product quality. The problem is that we don't really understand exactly the detailed biochemistry that works behind that. But because we can identify certain key metabolites uh, here circled in red, um, we know that if we monitor those and we make sure that they stay within certain defined limits, that we should have the maximum amount of high quality product produced at the end of it. Um, and so if we think about feeding the cells different things or uh, developing different processes by changing the temperature or the pH of the medium, that will percolate through the biochemistry to our product. And by monitoring these uh, metabolites, we will be able to um, understand a little bit better what's going on. So what we'd like to do is be able to develop um, genetically encoded biosensors or fluorescent indicators of the concentrations of these metabolites that we found to be important. And what we really want to do is to be able to um, understand from the amount of fluorescence that is in each cell, what is the intracellular concentration of that metabolite. And we'll be able to use that for various different activities. The first thing we can do is we can just do an empirical-based process design, basically a high-throughput screen, where we try different conditions and see, um, based on the different fluorescent levels that we get, which ones indicate more product or more quality. So currently, when you try to de develop um, equations that mathematically predict the behavior of your system, the biggest difficulty is populating these with data. It's very time consuming, and you need many, many data points in order to be able to accurately model that system. However, with the biosensors being somewhat of a high throughput screen, we can use those to develop our model. And once we have the model, we can also do model-based process design, which is that we let the equations predict what we should be doing for the cells um, by trying out different simulations in silico and, and getting a better understanding of the system. And then those two things together, the empirical process design and the model-based design, help us to develop an optimization strategy. And finally, once we have the model and we have the biosensors, what we can do is during production, we can monitor online the cells and make sure that the metabolite concentrations stay within the ranges that we know they need to be in order to increase our product quality. And in doing so, we can basically hook up an automated control system where a computer monitors the signal and does corrective action if anything falls out of range. So the types of biosensors we need to use then need to be able to accurately uh, quantify the metabolites. We don't just want something that goes on or off. We need to be able to um, understand um, what the concentrations are. And for this reason, we use the principle of forced or resonance energy transfer, or FRET, um, which is a, both a ratio metric and a quantitative measure. So again, the goal here is to monitor things in situ and in real time without being destructive in a very small volume. And uh, as I said in the beginning, we'd like these to be genetically encoded so that we don't have to uh, sample. Essentially, what we're doing is constructing fusion proteins of genetically encoded fluorophores, say a fluorescent protein like CFP or YFP, um, fused to a ligand binding domain. The two things that you need in order for FRET to work are that you need a donor and an acceptor fluorophore with an overlapping spectrum, such that the emission of the donor wavelength overlaps with the excitation of the acceptor. And you need those two fluorophores to be in close proximity. So FRET is a distance-based phenomenon, and therefore it needs to be um, within 10 to 100 angstroms in order to get any FRET. And the closer you are within that, the more FRET you'll get. And the procedure here is that you measure the donor and the acceptor emission when you excite the donor fluorophore, and divide those two to give you a FRET ratio. That FRET ratio will change as a function of distance. And if you have a limited population of molecules, you can back calculate the concentration using this, as I'll show you in a moment. And so therefore, in order to create a biosensor, what we need is we need a ligand binding domain that changes the distance between the fluorophores in response to the binding of the molecule. So there are two forms that this biosensor design can take. In every case, it's going to be a fusion of a genetically encoded fluorophore um, that serves as the donor, for example, CFP, one that serves as the acceptor, for example, YFP, and a ligand binding domain. But there are two ways that the energy transfer can happen. The first, which is shown on the left, is if you have FRET changes which occur in the presence of the molecule. So if you can think about a big floppy molecule out in solution, um, the donor and the acceptor fluorophores are separated, and so therefore if you excite at the blue wavelength, you get mostly just blue emission. However, now in the presence of the molecule, you get a binding event in the ligand binding domain, you get a conformational change, the fluorophores are in closer proximity, and therefore you get an energy transfer event, and now the amount of yellow fluorescence you detect will go up.
The other configuration you can have is, is something that's compact in the absence of the ligand, which is shown here on the right. And in this case, when you have no ligand present, when you excite with the donor um, excitation wavelength, you'll get energy transfer and you'll see an increase in the um, acceptor emission. Whereas when you bind the molecule, you can um, force those two to, to come further apart and therefore you'll, your fret ratio will go down. The other important consideration in biosensor design, and this is where most of the protein engineering comes in, is the behavior of your sensor. So the first thing that you have to worry about is what is the linear measurement range? What is the concentration during which your fret signal will be proportional to your ligand concentration? Any sensor you design will always follow a sigmoid shape. There will be a period below which there's not enough molecule for you to detect any fret signal changes. And there will be some concentration above which you can no longer detect changes when the, all of the molecules are saturated. And what you need to do is you need to find this linear measurement range and make it compatible with the concentrations of metabolites that you expect to encounter in the cells. And the way that's done, if you look at the little diagram below that, is you make mutations in the binding pocket, um, which change the affinity of the ligand binding domain for the ligand. The other consideration is the signal-to-noise ratio, which is shown on the bottom right-hand side. And that's really the difference between um, the fret ratios you find in the absence of ligand entirely and the fret ratios you find uh, when the uh, binding pockets are all saturated. And if you just take a random ligand binding domain and put the fluorophores on the end of it, what you often will find is that there's not very much fluorescence change there. What you need to do is optimize the structure of your fret biosensor in order to compensate for this. What you need to do is make sure that the donor and acceptor fluorophores are lined up on the same sort of plane and that there isn't too much flexibility in the linker region, otherwise you'll, be, you'll have sort of rotation around that bond and your, your fret ratio will decrease. And so this is usually done by um, engineering how you bind the molecules together or doing truncations in the linker region. So when we need to develop a new biosensor, there's a series of steps that we go through. The first thing we do is we do a metabolite assay to understand what range of metabolite we're likely to encounter in the cells of interest. And this is done through traditional measurements, cell culture sampling, quenching, and analysis using um, some kind of traditional um, analytical biochemistry technique. And then first we'll look in the literature and see if there are any existing FRET biosensors, and there are some quite active groups in this area, so often if it's an important metabolite, there will be one. And the example I'm going to show later uses someone else's biosensor. If not, we have to think about the considerations that I've just talked about and do some protein engineering where we try to identify suitable ligand binding domains and think about how those um, are connected to our fluorophores. When we've got a protein construct we think might work, we express it and purify it, uh, usually using E. coli for ease of use, and check it in vitro to make sure that it um, uh, measures the range of ligand concentrations we think it will make, will, that the signal-to-noise uh, ratio is appropriate, et cetera. And then if we're happy with that, we'll transfer it to a mammalian cell expression vector, transfect it into our cells, and go through the validation process again in vivo because the um, characteristics of the biosensor do depend on the environment, and so when you have the presence of the cell wall, for example, um, the, the behavior might be different, and we have to make sure that the biosensor is still suitable. So the example that I'm going to give is, is glucose biosensing in, in suspension CHO cells, Chinese hamster ovary cells. Um, and the first thing we need to know is what is the range of concentration of glucose that you experience intracellularly over the course of a, a CHO cell culture. Um, so this plot here shows the glucose concentration over the culture day, um, and this was done using a typical glucose oxidase enzymatic assay. And you can see that um, from days 3 to 8, which is what's plotted here, you see concentrations in the millimolar to high micromolar range. Um, and as I said, the first thing we'll do is we'll look and see if there's anything already in the literature, and um, in this case there is a series of existing, uh, well-characterized fret constructs for detecting glucose from Wolf Farmer's lab at uh, Carnegie Institute in Stanford. And in particular, these have been optimized to give the maximal signal-to-noise ratio and to measure a range of glucose concentrations. So we chose the most appropriate one from that, and we expressed it in E. coli. This one happens to work in the configuration that I talked about second, which is um, that when it binds the ligand, that decreases the fret ratio. So what the graph shows is that as you increase the concentration of glucose going from left to right, the fret ratio that you plot goes down. And our data um, with the fret biosensor in our hands was very similar to what was published in the paper. So from there, we cloned it into a mammalian expression vector and transfect it into suspension CHO cells under the control of a constitutive promoter so that the protein was always produced. We cultured these cells in, in batch in a flask and sampled them every day and 
from those samples, we simultaneously measured the FRET ratio, as well as the actual glucose concentration, again by quenching an enzymatic assay. And the reason we did this was because we wanted to construct a calibration curve which related the FRET ratio to the actual glucose concentration at that time. And so the top graph shows you the, the glucose concentration on the left-hand axis um, corresponding to the gray points, and the FRET ratio referring to the right-hand axis and plotted in the black points. And you can see again that the higher the glucose concentration, the lower the FRET ratio, indicating that the, this is the way that the sensor works. You take these measurements and construct a calibration curve, which is shown in the bottom graph. It, it fits fairly well over the range of 1 to 5 millimolar glucose concentration with an R squared of about 0 0.96. So now that we had calibrated the biosensor, we wanted to show that it worked in an industrial setting, and the application we chose was fed batch culture of the, of the CHO cells. So fed batch is a mode of culture in which the cells are s supplemented with nutrients in order to extend their life and their productivity period. And what we did was we uh, took the biosensor uh, expressing cell lines and we grew them in, again in flasks. Um, and on day six, we fed some of those flasks with enough glucose to bring the concentration in the medium up to 36 millimolar, which was the starting concentration in the medium. Throughout the culture, we sampled and measured again the FRET ratio and the actual glucose concentration. So on the top graph, the blue line is the normal batch culture um, cells that were not fed, and you can see that the FRET ratio steadily increases as the glucose is depleted. However, the blue line, which is the fed batch culture, you can see that after we fed the cells, the day indicated by the arrow on day six, the um, FRET ratio decreased, in indicating an increase in glucose concentration. And what we did was we took those FRET ratio measurements and our calibration curve from the, sl the slide previous to this, and we calculated the expected glucose concentration based on the calibration curve. And in the bottom graph, we show in blue the actual glucose concentration from our enzymatic assay versus the predicted concentration. And you can see that the predicted glucose concentration is quite similar to um, what uh, was calculated. So in our lab, we're trying to develop a series of these sensors for nutrients that we found to be important in bioprocessing in order that we can use them both for process development and for online monitoring.